From an early age, we learn how to get what we want from our parents or peers by putting certain looks that will evoke sympathy or affection. We learn to hide from our parents and siblings what exactly we are thinking or feeling. We learned how to fit into a group by wearing the same clothes and by doing the same things. As we got older and started to strive for a career, we learned how to create the proper font in order to be hired and to fit into a group culture. We learned to wear a mask to be accepted and to protect and help us get what we want. Now imagine for a second a person who never learned those acting skills, whose face instantly grimaces when he dislikes what you say or cannot suppress a yawn when you fail to entertain him. A person who always speaks his mind, who completely goes his own way in his ideas and style, who acts the same whether he's talking to his boss, dog, or a child. This person that you imagined will be avoided, ridiculed, and despised. Therefore, it has become essential to wear a mask. And in this video, we will learn how to see right through it from the best reader of men and women that has ever lived, Milton Erickson. Milton Erickson was one of the most influential psychologists of the 20th century, and as mentioned earlier, the best reader of men and women that has ever lived. In August 1919, when he was 17 years old, he was diagnosed with polio, a disease that paralyzed his entire body, except for his eyeballs. Being quarantined in the house with nothing to do, he started to become aware of things that he never observed before. One day, when his sisters talked among themselves, their faces made all kinds of movements. One sister said to another, Yes, that's a good idea. But she said that in a monotone tone and with a noticeable smirk, all of which seemed to convey the opposite. Somehow, a yes could really mean no. In the course of the next day, he counted 16 different forms of no that he heard, all accompanied by different facial expressions. On another occasion, he watched closely how one sister offered another an apple, but the tension in her face and tightness in her arms indicated she was just being polite and clearly wanted to keep it for herself. This signal was not picked up by others, and yet it seemed so clear to him. A sister could spend minutes beating around the bush, while her hidden desire was clearly indicated by her tone of voice, which gave emphasis to certain words. Several months later, as he sat near a window, he listened to his brother and sisters playing outside. He wanted so desperately to join them, as if momentarily forgetting his paralysis, in his mind he began to stand up, and for a brief second, he experienced the twitching of a muscle in his leg, the first time he had felt any movement in his body at all after so much time. The doctors had told his mother he would never walk again, but if the body reflects the mind, and the mind reflects the body, then couldn't he use his mind to control the body and prove the doctors wrong? So he decided to try an experiment. He would focus intensely on a particular muscle in his leg, remembering the sensation he had before his paralysis, wanting badly to move it and imagining it functioning again. Also, his nurse would massage that area. And through this excruciatingly slow process, he taught himself to stand, then take a few steps, and then walk. Somehow, by using his willpower and imagination, he was able to alter his physical condition and regain complete movement. Clearly, he realized the mind and the body operate together in ways we are hardly aware of. In the late 1920s, wanting to explore this further, he decided to pursue a career in medicine and psychology, and he began to practice psychiatry in various hospitals. Quickly, he developed a method that was completely his own and diametrically opposed to others trained in the field. While almost all practicing psychiatry focused largely on words, Erickson instead focused mostly on the physical presence of people as an entry into their mental life and unconscious. For his purpose, he kept a notebook to write down all of his observations. His motto was, observe, observe, observe. One element that particularly fascinated him was the walking styles of people. Perhaps it was because it was hard for him to regain his ability. He would watch people walk in every part of the city. He would look at the heaviness of the step the looping, the fluid walk, the meandering walk. He took note of sudden changes in the people's way of moving as they became excited or nervous. All of this gave him endless information about people's moods and self-confidence. In his office, he placed his desk at the far end of the room, making his patients walk toward him. He would notice changes in the walk from before to after the session to see if any change happened. He would examine their way of sitting down, the level of tension in their hands as they grasped the arms of the chair, the degree to which they would face him as they talked, and in a matter of a few seconds, without words being exchanged, he had a profound read on their insecurities as expressed clearly in their body language. 
One time, a beautiful young woman came to see him, saying she had seen various psychiatrists, but none of them were quite right. Could Erickson possibly be the right one? As she talked a while, never discussing the nature of her problem, Erickson watched her pick some lint off her sleeve. He listened and nodded. Then he asked some boring questions. All of a sudden, he said in a very confident tone that he was the right, in fact, the only psychiatrist for her. Surprised by his arrogant attitude, she asked him why he felt that way. He said he needed to ask her one more question in order to prove it. How long, he asked, have you been wearing women's clothes? How did you know? The man asked in astonishment. Erickson explained that he had noticed the way he had picked off the lint. Without making a naturally wide detour around the breast area, he had seen that motion too many times, while living with his seven sisters, to be fooled by anything else. Also, his assertive way of discussing his need to test Erickson first was decidedly masculine. All the other psychiatrists were fooled by the young man's extremely feminine appearance and voice, but the body does not lie. Over the years, his observational skills grew so much that he could capture nearly imperceivable nonverbal cues. He could tell when his secretary was menstruating by the heaviness of her typing. He could guess the career backgrounds of people by the quality of their hands, the heaviness of their step, and their vocal inflictions. To patients and friends, he seemed as if Erickson possessed psychic powers, but they were unaware of how long and how hard he had studied this gaining mastery of the second language. I don't understand that you're, you're psychic. <laughs> no, just paying attention. Body language is a type of nonverbal communication in which physical behaviors, as opposed to words, are used to express or convey information. Such behavior includes facial expressions, body posture, gestures, eye movement, touch, and the use of space. Body language exists in both animals and humans. For example, at dogs, tail wagging means that the dog is emotionally aroused. It could be excitement or frustration or something else, while baring his teeth means that the dog is sending a warning. The same goes for humans, where a genuine smile, one that has the muscles around the mouth and eyes engaged, will convey happiness, while fast blinking will convey possible nervousness. Some gestures and reactions are inborn which were built over thousands of years of evolution and are universal around the world, while others are learned by observation. The use of speech is still relatively new to human communication. We speak for about hundreds of thousands of years. Prior to that time, roughly two million years ago, most of our communication was similar to those of other animals. Understanding and sending nonverbal cues developed over so much time before the invention of language. It's the reason why the human face becomes so expressive and gestures so elaborate. It became bred deep within us. We are the preeminent social animal on the planet. We are depending on our ability to communicate with others for our survival and success. It is estimated that over 65% of all human communication is nonverbal, but that people pick up and internalize only about 5% of this information. What this means is that we are using only a small percentage of the potential social skills we all possess. Now take a moment to imagine how it will be like if you could actually pick up all of that information? What if you could see behind the mask that we all wear, and instead of a facade carefully created over the years, you will see the real person, just like Milton Erickson did? Unfortunately, we are not trained to pay attention to people's nonverbal cues. By sheer habit, we fixate on the words people say, while also thinking about what we'll say next. To fix this, you will need to get rid of this habit of thinking about what you will say next and create a new one one in which you start paying attention to the people's nonverbal cues they emit. For Milton Erickson, his sudden paralysis opened his eyes to not only a different form of communication, but also a complete different way of relating to people. When he listened to his sisters and picked up new information from their faces and voices, he not only registered this with his senses, but also felt himself experiencing some of what was going on in their minds. He had to imagine why they said yes, but really meant no. And in doing so, he had to momentarily feel some of their contrary desires. He had to see the tension in their necks and register it physically as tension within himself to understand why they were suddenly uncomfortable in his presence. What he discovered is that nonverbal communication cannot be experienced simply through thinking and translating thoughts into words, but must be felt physically as one engages with the facial expressions or locked positions of other people. It is a different form of knowledge one that connects with the animal part of our nature and involves our mirror neurons. To master this language, he had to relax and control the continual need 
to interpret with words or categorize what he was seeing. He had to tamp down his ego, thinking less of what he wanted to say and instead directing his attention outward into another person, attuning himself to their changing moods as reflected in their body language. As he discovered, such attention changed him. It made him more alive to the signs people continually emit and transformed him into a superior social actor, capable of connecting to others' inner lives and developing a greater rapport. In short, to train yourself to read people, you will need to do two things. First, you must recognize your state of self-absorption and how little you actually observe. You must direct your attention outward instead of inward. In your daily life, as you interact with people, if you pay close attention to your tone of voice, your manners, to your whole body language, you will see that it changes depending on the person you are talking to. In order to train yourself to become a reader of people, you should try to see this mechanism in others. Try to observe how your friends react when they see you versus how they react when they see others. Are they happy to see you or are they distressed? Second, you must make use of empathy to feel on a physical level what the other is feeling. You do not simply observe their facial expressions but register it from within. And as your sensitivity increases, you will begin to notice more and more of what you have been missing and you will discover a new and deeper way of relating to people one that will highly increase your social powers. The information from this video was taken from the book The Laws of Human Nature by Robert Greene. This book sits at the top of our list of the best books anyone should read. The chapter on nonverbal communication covers more than we did, and so for a deeper understanding of the nonverbal communication, read the book.